from the Hebrew um, Testament of Micah. Is what shall I come before the Lord? The question was always, what do we have to do? What do we have to do? And Micah, uh, and then there are all these things. Do I have to bring burnt offerings? We can. Will the Lord be pleased with you know, everything I own? Do I have to come up with stuff? And uh, Micah, speaking for God, says, God has shown you what's good. Uh, the Lord just requires that you act justly, love <coughs> and walk humbly with God. And so this series looks at how we have interpreted that, how we have ignored that, how we have overlooked it uh, throughout the centuries. And when we began <coughs> our first series last time, we looked at morality plays. The very beginning of Christianity, and Dr. Wansink spoke about how early Christians dealt with this text. And then we zoomed up to the year 1000, and Dr. Malone talked about morality plays, the concept of acting out one's faith, the faith stories on their way home from the cathedral, because in the cathedral they had no opportunity to actually participate. And that leads us to this section, where, which deals around the 1700s up through the 18th century. And uh, the oratorio becomes very popular in the musical world during this century. And that is almost like a morality play set to music where everyone stands still. So instead of acting out the drama, they sing about the, uh, the um, text in the Bible. All of them dealt with Hebrew Testament subjects, never Christian Testament or New Testament subjects. Because for some reason that seemed inappropriate, but the others, or maybe there was more drama, whatever the deal, the composers found that to be quite effective. Large chorus, large musical forces, and that was because in this era also was the time the equal temperament was um, developed or agreed upon. So all musicians agreed on a certain way of tuning their instruments, rather than everyone tuning to please themselves. So large forces could participate. Uh, the oratorio was very similar in some ways to the opera, and it took the opera's place during Lent and uh, Advent, the penitential seasons in the Christian year. Because at that time, entertainment was not allowed during those four weeks of Advent or the 40 days, not counting Sundays of Lent. So you have an empty theater, you have a lot of musicians with nothing to do, and somebody has the bright idea of, could we not stage an oratorio at that time? It's a religious subject. It'll meet all the requirements of the church. It'll put all those musicians to work, because you know when musicians are idle, bad things can happen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and it makes money, too. So in light of our scripture, I wonder if you're doing a good thing, but you can make money, too. Does that somehow lessen that good thing? Uh, but the interesting thing also about this period is congregational song in the Christian church <laughs> flourishes, this concept of hymn singing. But these are two very different things. This um, oratorio is for the professional musician, prepared well in advance, a uh, more difficult style of music. Congregational song or hymns are designed for unmusical people to sing. They're very simple, very few leaps in the melody. They are strophic, meaning you're doing the same thing over and over and over again. And they're designed to be a vehicle to teach elements of the faith. The most famous oratorio is probably Messiah, which is on a Christian Testament subject and was considered to be blasphemous when it first came out. Uh, Handel, a German composer who sort of became a English expatriate, or expatriate from Germany to England, developed it, wrote it in 1742. He was a friend of the Wesleys, who Dr. Lundwall will talk about a little bit later, because they traveled in high circles. Um, as a person who has written a word or two, I'm always keen on who writes the text to the <coughs> Anybody know who wrote the text to Messiah? It's from the Bible, so, I think. Not Bach, yeah. but he was a contemporary of Handel's. Handel. Handel wrote the music. Isaiah. Isaiah. Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. No, no, no. They are biblical texts throughout, but they were crafted together by a fellow by the name of Charles Jennings, J E N N E N S, who uh, wrote several sets of lyrics that he presented to Handel. And handle set to music. 
but Handel was probably the foremost oratorio writer of his day. Today we're going to look at two different subjects, art in the church and the system of patronage, and also John and Charles Wesley, who uh, are dear and dear to us. We might not even be here without them. Before you leave today, if you have not received an arts brochure from the college with the rest of this series, as well as uh, theater and music events, I uh, want for me to take one of those. You have a question. Why was um, the Messiah considered blasphemous? They had never treated uh, a deity. The other oratorio subjects were on uh, Judas Maccabeus, Deborah, Esther, okay. uh, all kinds of <coughs> characters, but uh -huh. not God, Jesus, Holy Spirit. Kind of okay. Thank you. Any other questions? We'll have questions at the end, but now we can join me in welcoming Dr. Joyce Hell. Imagining Divine Space in the work of Leonardo and Caravaggio. And a lot of the work that I'm going to, the ideas that I'm presenting on Leonardo's Last Supper really come from Leo Steinberg's wonderful book on the incessant Last Supper. Next slide, please. So um, Leonardo was in Milan from Florence. He, he wrote a letter to the Duke of Milan and said, hey, I can design cities for you, war machines. I can be your engineer, and if you need something painted, I could do that too. He did not consider himself a visual artist. I think of today he would consider himself an inventor, an engineer, uh, really. Anyway, he got up there and he did a few other artistic projects in addition to, work, to his work for the Duke of Milan, and one of them was, of course, painting the Last Supper in the refectory, the dining room, uh, for, the prior, for the priests of uh, Santa Maria della Grazia. He um, was always innovative. He tried adding oil to the fresco medium, which did not work, or it had no sustainability. I think it looked perfectly fine when he first did it, but it hasn't lasted. So yeah, thank you. So the next, so we're going to be looking at this um, <coughs> later um, engraving before the work was so destroyed to, um, to, to try to understand what were the real innovations. So generally artists would often show um, a, a Last Supper with all the heads kind of lined up or they might be on an opposite side of the table. Um, Leonardo's innovation was to group them in four groups of three on either side to make this beautiful disegno or composition. And each of the groups sort of interact with each other with their gestures and so on. So pictorially, it's very interesting and it's very dramatic. 
And of course, Jesus is in the center. They're set in a perspective space. You seem to see the room go back, so they have a believable sense of space in, in which they're in. But I want to point out a couple of really interesting things about, and this, and this is true for many of the specific details throughout the fresco, but I want to particularly look at um, St. John the Beloved and St. Thomas. This always happens here. We go. St. John the Beloved over here and St. Thomas. Could you click, please? The next one. Um, so St. John the Beloved, forget what Dan Brown wrote. In <laughs> um, the iconography of St. John, he was very you know, tender-hearted. So he's always shown very fair, very um, sweet, uh, fine hair, curly hair. But this particular image of him, if you'll notice, shows his, his hands clasped, his big fingers um, intertwined. And this um, is very noticeable in the fresco. Next. <coughs> the hand of Jesus and the hand of the apostle next to him sort of in frame it. This is how St. John um, the Beloved is always shown beneath the cross, under the crucifixion, when he's wringing his hands. Next slide, please. And I could show you hundreds of examples of this. This is his iconography mm -hmm. of his witnessing the death of Jesus. Uh, so it's a time of, you know, it's a grief gesture. Um, often along with the Virgin. So what, the, what Leonardo did was to conflate that moment in the future and when he's grieving for the death of Christ with the moment of the Last Supper, so collapsing time together by this invention. Next, please. Um, and on the other side, you're probably more familiar with this iconographic. The, the guy pointing his hand is, of course, whom? The guy who stuck, stuck his finger into Jesus' wound? Thomas. Doubting Thomas. So next slide, please. So in Leonardo's fresco, he's very forcibly, do I have the right hand, whichever one is to. Um, and I could show you again, you know, hundreds of these iconographic examples of St. Thomas, of the Apostle Thomas, are, um, you know, sticking his hand into the wound of Christ. And again, this is something that happens after the resurrection. So where, where Leonardo is pushing us ahead in time to, to the time of salvation, to the time of the crucifixion, to the time of the resurrection, at the moment of the Last Supper. Next, please. And of course, Jesus in the middle, um, he's sitting in a perspective space and he puts his hands out so, so they sort of make the orthogonals, which are technically those diagonal lines of a perspective, um, but projecting it out um, into the space in which it's located. He's having the Last Supper. This is the moment, of course, where you know, he talks about the <coughs> ritual, but he also initiates the uh, ritual or initiates the action which becomes the ritual of the Eucharist, of the bread and the blood, which creates the you know, communion um, with him uh, in the, and you know, projecting to the future. And in the context of, uh, of the room, he's actually engaging the people who would be sitting before him, having their meal at the moment that he's having his. So just as Leonardo communicates this alternative experience of time within the narrative vis-a-vis -vis Thomas, and John the Beloved, he also conflates Christ's Supper, next, with the meals of the holy community of priests who eat every day at the refectory of Santa Maria della Grazia. And if you could, you could almost imagine, you know, the tables full of the priests in here, the monk, how do you call them monk? Would they be monks? I don't know what the Italian word for it. It doesn't sound very Italian, monk. Um, so he would be kind of creating a perspective from where he's sitting that would encompass them. And even, you know, one hand is even pointing to the church uh, where they would, which is in the other side of the building, but that's a whole other story. So this is a really remarkable pictorial invention to tell something so subtle, well, I don't know if subtle is the right word, but so invisible about the sacred narrative and the nature of time and the nature of salvation. Next, please. Probably um, a different technique, but equally remarkable, is what Caravaggio does when he um, designs the pictures to go into the uh, chapel of, of the uh, uh, Virgin of the Ascension. He didn't do that painting in the middle, um, in uh, Santa Maria del Popolo in Rome, and this was around the early 17th century. Um, this picture represents the conversion of, of Saul on the way to Damascus. You know, Saul was a Roman soldier during the period of persecution. He's on the way to Damascus, and suddenly he's confronted by this gigantic light that knocks him off his horse. And he falls back in amazement, and he has a vision. He's converted. He becomes a follower of Christ. He becomes Paul, 
um, who is very instrumental, of course, in um, you know, the founding um, of the Christian church in the, in the ancient world. Such a remarkable picture for many years. <coughs> Caravaggio foreshortens the figure of Paul dramatically, so that if, and instead of a figure that, instead of creating a pictorial space that looks like it gives the illusion that it's going on behind or, or into depth, uh, the figure of Paul or Saul is actually coming out, spilling out into our space, and that immediately engages the viewer, the person who's there um, with it. Um, so his body is foreshortened. We see him from the top of the head. But even more remarkable is that in the center of this painting, there's nothing. Bupkis, you know, it's like this shabby side of a horse. Uh, there's, um, we're in, if you look at like the image of the Virgin, you know, in most religious paintings, whoever's the most important would be uh, right at the center. So Caravaggio is very, very innovative in making this, you know, nothing in the middle of the picture. But that's not it, even. That's not even it. Um, when you're in the chapel, you see how there's that window over the center, and the light comes in on an angle that corresponds with the lighting in the picture. And when you're standing there, you are in the space where it's happening. And, uh, you know, of course, he knew where the painting was going to go. He designed it specifically. Next slide. I think it's, you know, it's very hard to, to get this in a slide. You have to really go to the chapel uh, to see this. Uh, but there's another image. The picture, and that's some tourist's image of what it looks like when you're in there. So, uh, Caravaggio uses real space of Santa Maria del Popolo Chapel um, so that the congregant is physically part of the mystical event. Again, this collapse of time and space, very innovative. And, uh, next slide, please. So, what does before the Lord mean um, with these pictorial strategies? Uh, they encourage the viewer to transcend time and space and experience perpetual presence of the Lord. But that's the end of that sequence. Next, please. Um, by the early 17th century, um, uh, in Europe, uh, these pictorial innovations have been well established, and they were <coughs> adapted in very interesting ways by the rich and powerful. Next, please. Um, I'm, so I'm going to concentrate here on the shall I come and who these privileged eyes were. Um, we'll look at the 17th century patrons and the artists who created their publicity images. Um, these were the people, I guess, if you go back to the book, they could have brought all those rams and trailers <laughs> of oil and whatever else you wanted. Uh, they had it. Next, please. So we'll first look at their Nini. Their Nini is St. Teresa in ecstasy. Now this is St. Teresa of Avila, and she was a mystical saint of the 16th century. This is a painting by Rubens of her. Next, please. Um, but of course, Bernini's famous image is of the moment of her ecstasy, uh, where her, she has a vision of, of, a, of an angel with golden arrows who pierces her heart. Um, and uh, Bernini shows her absolutely swooning. Teresa de describes this as a very sort of physical sensation. Um, this is what's really interesting about this is not only how Bernini dramatizes it, but next, please, uh, how it's installed at the church in the chapel in the Corona um, uh, uh, Cornaro Chapel of uh, Santa Maria della Vittoria. Look at the sides. Do you see who's watching the event? always and forever. There's two box seats where the patrons of the Cornaro family are sitting for the live performance of St. Teresa in Ecstasy. And we'll take a look at those in detail. Next, please. So there they are watching. And this is, this is the box seat on the side. The second guy on the right is uh, Federico uh, Cornaro, the Cardinal of Venice, and the guy who paid for the whole chapel. Next, please. It's not unusual to include patrons, the people who pay for the work of art, within the work of art. Here's a late medieval example and a Renaissance example where the patrons <coughs> appear to be, you know, participating in, in, the, in the worship and glorification. Next. But this is a little bit different. <laughs> <laughs> so we as the Catholics, when you're in, when you're in the church, you have to be on the other side of the balustrade. <laughs> so you get to watch the Cornaro family watching uh, St. Teresa in Exodus. <laughs> so uh, instead of presence, congregants become observers. Next, please. 
So um, we're going to look at two other examples. That's a portrait of Federico Cornaro, whose uh, chapel of, uh, who was a patron of Bernini. And we're going to then look at Maffeo Barberini, who was Pope uh, Urban VIII, and then the wonderful Marie de Medici. And this will go kind of fast. But I, I, I picked out these 17th century paintings, but I could have picked a lot more. For instance, next, Scipione Borghese, or Paul, next. Or Paulina Borghese, or um, Alessandro Farnese, or uh, Madame de Pompadour, or, oh, oh. whoops, uh, you all know who this is? This is the Bishop of Blaine. Yeah. Next, please. This was a guy that Francis just kicked out, just suspended for having spent four million dollars on his own private chapel. Yeah, that's is it church money? I'm mean, forty-two million. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, four million on the chapel. Four million oh. on the chapel. Forty-two million dollars on the residence. Wow. Mm -hmm. out. Yeah. He's been <laughs> good. <laughs> Next, please. <laughs> Pietro, Pietro de Cortona. <coughs> Uh, created his frescoes in the Barberini Palace to show that the Barberini family has complete access to heaven. Um, <laughs> the Virgin Mary and then all these other heavenly beings are carrying around the elements from the, the coat of arms. You can see the crown and the keys and the beautiful bees that stand for the Barberinis. Next, please. And it's all an illusionistic ceiling. So those are some details. Here's the whole thing. The whole thing. Next, please. Um, and now we're going to look at not all of it, but some of the 22 paintings. So this isn't really religious art because the gods in it are Olympian. <laughs> I guess it's something that's really good. But um, the 22 paintings that Rubens created for Marie de Medici to decorate her palace at Luxembourg. And that's one of them. Um, they're 13 feet tall and at least 10 feet wide. Some of them are wider. Um, and you can't get into the Palais de Luxembourg now, but they were installed on the grand staircase. But that's just one for Rubens. It's a government building. <laughs> Um, so um, these these show how rich she is, how powerful she is, and how she has divine approval of the Olympian gods. Uh, this is when uh, before she married Henry IV. She's an Italian princess, and they sent her portrait, and they were married by proxy. And then she comes to France, and she lives there. Um, eventually, she gives birth to Louis the Thirteenth. When Henry dies, she becomes the regent for a long time, um, and then, of course, uh, Henry the, the she, she's the grandmother of Louis the Fourteenth, and he's probably the most famous monarch that she's related to. So next, please. So um, of course, that's her portrait there, and showing the um, divine approval of Jupiter Junior, and the guy carrying the god, godling carrying the portrait <coughs> is um, Hymenaeus. Uh, Hymenaeus. I'm not sure. You know, the god of marriage. Who knew? Um, the <laughs> for that. Um, and, and the personification of France over here. Next, please. The felicity of the Regency shows how just she is. And, you know, everybody's got to approve of that. I'm not going to go through the iconography <coughs> of the figure of France. Next, please. Rem remember how big these are. One of the things that I think of, I love these paintings. They're just so over the top. Um, and it's really hard, I think, to, for us to relate to them. I remember, you know, the first time I went to Europe, I realized I got no idea what monarchy even is, and I didn't until I first saw a palace, you know, living as a you know, member of this fine republic. Um, but th these paintings always make me think that when he was a little boy, Louis XIV might have been at Granny's house, you know, and seen all these and said, wow, there's some good costumes in Granny's house. I want to dress up, too. <laughs> There he is. <laughs> um, but we got to remember that these powerful patrons, we think of them as totally egotistical, but that wasn't it. Next hit it. L'état c'est moi. They considered themselves to be the state. You know, they weren't, they weren't just them. They were the whole country of France. Um, I guess. It would be hard to carry that around, but um, they did it. Next, please. Um, so this I wasn't just a person. There's another one of Marie de Medici, of course, after a great victory over the Austrians, that she's the whole state. Next. And this is, are you familiar with, you might not, have, you might not be familiar with this artist, Kehinde Wilde, but um, he makes images that are in the mode of all of these incredible over-the-top portraits of the of, um, you know, throne and altar portraits. 
And there's something so deeply anachronistic about the way the Hindi Wildy, Wildy's paintings look, I think, because even though the people are really rich and they're celebrities or you know, they, they look like they could be, they're not the state. <laughs> you know, they're just a person. Yes. I tried to look in with the Protestant tradition for images that might be comparable, and I could find none. <laughs> there was this really kind of silly image of the martyrdom of Charles I, but kind of silly. Next, please. Um, when I think about Im images of the, within the Protestant tradition, I always think about Memento Maurice. Um, the, these are images that remind one of the transience of life and the vanity mm. of worldly things. Uh, this is a colonial American portrait of Thomas Smith, where he's got a skull uh, included in the portrait to remind you that we're all you know, skeletons underneath. And the poem, next please. Why should I the world be minding? I'm going to change the old English a little. Therein in worlds of evil finding. Then farewell, world, farewell thy cares, thy joys, thy toils, thy wiles, thy wars. Truth sounds retreat, I'm not sorry. The eternal draws to him my heart by faith, which can thy force, the force of the world, subvert to crown me after grace with glory. Next, please. The end of all of this, and the patronage, is, of course, the Enlightenment era. Um, in the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment commitments to um, reason and uh, political freedoms and all of this really meant an end to church patronage and often iconoclastic vandalism against church art. These are some statues that are in the Musée Cluny in Paris that got their heads removed during the French Revolution. Next. And then somebody found the head so that they were <laughs> <laughs> placed right next to them. But <laughs> They were church sculptures. <coughs> the revolutionaries actually thought that they were German, I mean that they were French kings and queens, but they were actually kings and queens of the Old Testament. But the French kings and queens paid for them to as a publicity image, so it's okay. Next, please. Um, so the Enlightenment commitments turned the Cathedral of Strasbourg, for instance, into the Temple of Reason. And of course, we have in our American tradition the separation of church and state. If you wanted to say, when I talked about Leonardo's innovations with not putting all the heads in a row, here's somebody who couldn't manage that. <laughs> Independence around here, John Trumbull, American artist extraordinaire. Um, next, please. So um, after the Enlightenment, instead of patronage of throne and altar, um, the, the artist's job is to express um, artistic freedom. Gauguin and contemporary artist, a uh, body and earth artist, Anna Mendieta. Next, please. Oh my God, I just got three more things to say. So, to summarize, how would the micro question uh, relate to the art of the Zen era? The Renaissance artist, how shall I come before the Lord? Uh, the answer might be wrong question. You're already here and always have been. Next. The answer for the Medicis and the Barberinis might be, well, the Lord will certainly attend if you throw a party. You'll already <laughs> live in the same neighborhood. Next. And in the context of Puritanism, the answer might be, um, how shall I come before the Lord? Just remember that when you come before the Lord, you won't, you won't have all those rams anymore. <laughs> Charles Wesley, the brothers born in the 18th century. And looking at the question, with what shall I come before the Lord? First, we have to ask about them. What was the church in which they were reared? They were reared in the Anglican Church, the Church of England. Church and state were bound together. We find at this time, too, the Enlightenment is beginning to happen. The church becomes very rational. And you've got all of these dissenting groups down here. Everything from the Jews and the Jesuits, the Roman Catholics that are there, to the levelers, to the people who um, are Minions, and then finally the divorcees at the end. So you can get all kinds of people together uh, there, anyone that wasn't Anglican. During this time, Punch Magazine, which was the Harvard Lampoon of its day, the Saturday Night Live of its day, took on the church and began to say the church was becoming so rich, 
rational, so ritualistic that they had really lost what their whole faith was about. So they had nothing to come before the Lord. You have the two traditions going on for the Wesley brothers, the sacramental, which is the Roman Catholic and the Anglican, and then the Reformed, the Calvinists, the Presbyterians, and all the others coming up. But at the same time, you've got this division in England between the wealthy and the poor. Hogarth, William Hogarth, who was a great caricaturist of this time, will later on mock the Methodist, and that's a whole other lecture of how satire and the Methodists come together. But here he just shows the world into which the Methodist boys were born. It's a time where gin is all over the place. In fact, people would feed their babies gin rather than milk. And so you've got all of this kind of depravity going on in England. So what did the Lord give John and Charles Wesley as they came into the world? The first thing he gave, gave them were these two parents, Samuel and Suzanne. Samuel was a would-be poet. He was a vicar in a church. Now the problem with the Anglican church is generally the landed gentry's third or fourth son who couldn't do anything else was made into an Anglican priest. So if you were one of the runts of the family, you were given the sinecure position to kind of run over a church. You didn't have to worry about preaching or anything else. You would collect the dues from the state for your job. Unfortunately, Samuel wasn't one of those. He was more, came from a dissenting line, and even though he became an Anglican, he tried to spend all of his time writing poetry. He wrote poetry to the queen. He divide, kind of devoted, uh, dedicated one of his works to uh, Queen Anne. Now, Susanna was the mother. She had many children. In fact, she had 18 children, only half of which lived. But she was stubborn. And this stubbornness is a gift that she's going to pass on, at least to John Wesley. Uh, one afternoon, she would hold kind of Bible studies on Sunday afternoon. And for a woman to do this was really quite shocking and radical. And her husband told her to stop because her congregation was getting larger than his. <laughs> she had all of these people who would come, men and women and children. And so he said, you have to stop. And she said, husband, if you do, after all, think fit to dissolve this assembly, do not tell me that you desire to do it. For that will not satisfy my conscience. But send me your positive command in such full and expressive terms as may absolve me from all the guilt and punishment for neglecting to do this opportunity for doing good. As you and I someday are going to stand before the Lord and he's going to say, who stopped this assembly? And it'll basically be you. And you'll be the one that's damned. And so Susanna has this kind of strength that is just wonderful that she will pass on to her boys. Uh, they were so strong-willed, these two, that once when Samuel would pray for King William as king, and Susanna refused to say amen, she preferred the other. And so when he said, if this is so, you and I must part, for if we have two kings, we shall have two beds. He left the house, had no relations with her for about a year, but realizing he needed her, he came back, and within nine months, John Wesley was born. <laughs> so it's a wonderful story of how you need to pray together as a husband and wife. She had strict discipline for her children. She was a wonderful. She gave the discipline that, and the methods of discipline that will come to her sons. Uh, she basically had a time for talking to each of her children. On Monday, she would talk with Molly, then Hetty, then Nancy, then Jackie, then Patty, then Charles. Charles had Saturday evening. On their fifth birthday, their formal education began. They attended classes for six hours on the first day they were supposed to learn the whole alphabet. The children, including their daughters, learned Latin and Greek. And here is one of the old kind of divines of the church. Uh, you didn't realize he was back there then. Uh, one of the ancestors of Professor Ben Hallett um, was, it, was it kind of Greek and Latin. Then there was, as the boys grew up, that someone set the mass on fire. They did not like the rector, Ch uh, Samuel. And so they set the house on fire, and at the last minute, John Wesley was up in the attic, and they had to kind of create a human ladder to go and rescue him. He was basically what they called, from the, from the, the <laughs> Old Testament, a brand plucked from the burning, uh, from Zechariah. And so you see in this house, this ordinary house, this manse where the rector lived, the fire started, and then they had to rescue the little baby, and they did. And so he felt that God had given him a special calling. His mother emphasized that to him. 
And his mother, the importance of mothers we cannot underestimate, of telling their children that you are called by God, you are loved by God, and there is a purpose for your life. And John believed it when his mother told him. He and his brother Charles went off to, off to Oxford, and they started the Holy Clubs. And this is where, kind of, it's like a lot of freshmen at Virginia Wesleyan. When they first come, they don't really get into Holy Clubs. They spend their time in debauchery and drinking and everything else. So did Charles Wesley. Charles was known for kind of playing a little bit. John was not. But Charles was the one who started the clubs. And when the clubs came together, they were called them Bible moths because they spent so much time devouring the scripture. They also called them Methodists. Methodists because they had a method of living their life. And so John brought this discipline that his mother had given him to the Lord and to his clubs. There were 22 questions they would ask each other every week that they met. Did the Bible live in you today? Am I proud? Am I selfish? How do I spend my spare time? And so this time of introspection, they would bring themselves before the Lord. However, that led to acts of kindness. I mean, I kind of imagine, I tried to look for a picture of Diane Hortley, but I couldn't find it because it's really visiting the poor, visiting the prisons, going to people who were hungry and needy and ill. And so the boys would do this during their college days. They were out there kind of serving others. However, they had an invitation by Governor James Oglethorpe to come to Georgia and start a colony. As you know, they took all the criminals and our criminal justice faculty are the kinds of people who would go to Georgia. And they set it up. But Charles and John, Charles was fine. He was the secretary for Oglethorpe. But John went out and became the rector of Christ Church down in Savannah. And as he was down there, they began to kind of celebrate him, but nobody really liked him. He was really annoying. He was one of the most irritating people because he was very prissy and pushy. He fell in love with a young woman named Sophia, and he didn't know whether to marry her, so he cast lots. Basically, he gambled. If it came up one sign, he would marry her. If another, he would go away. And third, he would just wait. It came up third, he had to wait. Sophia decided not to wait. She married someone else. He excommunicated her from the church. Her father was one of the governors, so John and Charles had to leave Georgia very quickly. Okay? They did have a ministry to Indians, the Native Americans there as well, though, uh, going up. But as he was going back, there were storms at sea, and he became just worried. He said, I am not worthy. I am not the kind of person that can serve God. All my life is full of sin. In fact, in his journals, the time you find that, he would write, I resolved not to kiss Polly again. And then three weeks later, his, his journal says, I resolved never to touch a woman's breast again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> not going to go any farther with his journals, but just to know that he was a real boy. Okay, he was a real young man. And he looked at his own life, and there were so many things in his life that he felt were inadequate. He said, I've got to bring all my sin and my need before the Lord. And so out of his humility, he could come before the Lord. It was the Moravians who, on this kind of sea voyage, were having just a wonderful time singing and praising God. The Moravians had this wonderful, healthy piety that John looked at and said, I want that. What is that? And he couldn't get it. So he talked to one Moravian leader, Peter Bowler. And Peter Bowler said, start preaching. Preach until you have faith, and then because you have it, you will preach faith. It's very much the same kind of holy habit that was recommended this time by Bishop Tench. He said, essentially, for people who have problems loving your wife, he said, kiss your wife because you love her, and then you will love your wife and want to kiss her. It is out of habits, establishing good habits in your life, habits of virtue, that you find that the feelings will follow. And so Bora came and told him. Then the key day came for him on May 28, 1738, right off of Fleet Street in London, St. Paul's Cathedral is down here, and he went to a little meeting at Aldersgate Street. At Aldersgate Street, people would come in late, but that was okay, because they were always welcome at Aldersgate. Now, what happened when he went there, he said, in the evening I was very unwilling to go to the society meeting in Aldersgate, where one was reading from Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. At about a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ. 
Christ alone for my salvation. An assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. This phrase, strangely warm, becomes one of the great phrases of all Methodist and Wesleyan history. That he was strangely warm. It wasn't just his mind that he was giving to God, but now it was heart. And he brought this new warmth, this new kind of desire and enthusiasm down to Bristol, where he began preaching to the poor. He went and he started preaching outdoors, and this was blasphemy to all the very proper Anglicans. And I'm an Anglican, so it's, it's like today, Wesley would be like Pat Robertson, who I like Charles Wesley much better than either one of those other two, okay? <laughs> There's something you look and you say, this person is doing things that are just not right, and so you feel uncomfortable with them. But John, in humility, did these kinds of things. He went out there. They would hold open-air meetings, and people would preach for four hours. Can you imagine a professor preaching to you for four hours? Another professor. Okay. <laughs> okay. But then Charles. Charles is the good brother. Uh, he did have a little bit of a temper, but he is the one who loves his wife, loves life, loves to kind of eat and drink, and believes so much in the Anglican Church. And he was the one who wrote between... 8 and 9,000 hymns and poems. Every day he would sit down and write lyrics and write something new. And it wasn't like a little ditty like we have in religious worship today. These were hymns that were rooted in theology. These had ideas in them. Uh, and they would be used different times. And I want to just kind of play one little clip from Catherine and William's royal wedding.
almost anybody. It's really amazing. It's Charles Wesley who is still part of the British tradition, whose hymns are still there. His Easter hymn, Christ the Lord is Risen Today, over a thousand tongues to sing. And the one you all know, uh, besides this, is... Just a touch of this you need. <laughs> Not this. Thanks, Billy. Billy is pretty much a descendant, however, of Wesley. Oh. Kind of the holiness tradition that comes out of this. A couple lines. Is that John Wesley? I'm going to have you stand still. I know it's not yet Thanksgiving, but still, stores have put their stuff up. sinners reconciled, bringing together. And so coming before the Lord, he comes and he recognizes what the Lord has given him, Charles. And so I kind of <laughs> close with this. Basically, enthusiasm is what the Methodists gave the world. They were called by the Anglicans the enthusiasts because they would worship with singing and dancing and praising. Not like maybe modern Methodists. But enthusiasm means in theos, in God. To be enthusiastic means that you are in God, you praise God. And this wonderful kind of quote by John, all the, do all the good you can do by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can as long as you ever can. It is a good thing that he has brought before the Lord that he gives us. And I close with kind of a tribute to Elaine Eyre, who is wonderfully here. She doesn't realize that she did the next slide, because what John and Charles Wesley have given me are two things that are incredible. My wife and my job. If it had not been for Virginia Wesley, I would be out wandering as a peripatetic professor. And I met my wife at the United Methodist Church of Virginia Beach at a concert of Handel's Messiah. So I am thankful for John and Charles. And the best of all is, as we know on campus, God is with us. What we need now is a statue of Charles to go with him. Thanks. <laughs>